Hello, I'm Roger Killen, the founder of Get Inspired Talks. Our mission is to give experts and their fresh ideas a loud voice. This starts with the video you're about to view. Right after the speaker's talk, you'll be challenged to do one small thing to support the speaker's fresh idea. So watch the video all the way through and take up the speaker's challenge. Remember, action takers are difference makers. This story begins on a park bench five blocks from here with one promise. Three days before Christmas, 1989, I sat in the downtown east side in one of the poorest postal codes in Canada. I was young, I was homeless, and beside me was a shopping cart filled with cans and bottles. I'd made every possible mistake that a young person could make. In fact, that's a picture of me from that time frame. I was one of those individuals that you'd look at and wonder to yourself, how does a young person end up homeless, living in the downtown east side? To answer that question, we need to go much farther back in the story to understand. I was born and raised in Midland, Ontario, Canada. I had an older brother and a younger sister. This is me in Mrs. Morrison's class and grade two. And I remember as a child, my life was fantastic. It was like a Disney after school special. I was happy, I was curious. I had a tree fort and a fat little dog named Angus that had magical powers. He could hear you unwrap a cheese wrapper from three blocks away. Everything in my life was perfect. And then one day, life life me. And we got a knock on the door. Now, my father was this extraordinary man in my life. He was this hero. He was the kind of man who I would look into his eyes and I could see my possibility. And just like that, one day he was gone. A man who would say things to me like, I love you, son. You can do and be anything. Our family went through the kind of trauma and tragedy that you'd think about in an event like that. And one of the challenges is not just losing that that figure who I looked up to and I could see my possibility, but also we lost our economic well-being. Just like that, overnight, we went from a happy mom and dad, three-kid family, to a single mom struggling with poverty and uncertainty. The next man that came into our home, he wasn't anything like my father. He was a, a violent, abusive alcoholic. And so I went from a father who would say things like, I love you, you can do and be anything, to a man who would say things like, you're stupid, you're dumb, and you'll never amount to anything. At nine years old, I had fissures in my self-esteem and self-worth, and I was struggling to fit in and find my place in the world when the opportunity to experiment and use drugs came along. And I jumped, and I joined. And for the first time when I went home, the uncertainty and the fear that uh, surrounded myself in that home was was gone and I felt safe. And for the next 15 years, it became a familiar place for me to run to, to cope with the uncertainty in my life. By the time I was 15, I was angry and I began pushing back. Uh, At 15 years old, I had a fight with that man and I left. And at 15 years old, I was now couch surfing, fending for myself. At 16 years old, I dropped out of school. At 17 years old, I went to prison for the first time. When I was 19, I decided to leave that small community that I lived in in Ontario, and I got on a Greyhound bus, and I came out here, and I I got off that bus just near Georgia Street, across from the Sandman. And what happened over the next several years can be explained in watching a young man's life unravel until I was on that park bench. Three days before Christmas, 1989, I was on that park bench, and I was beginning to descend into withdrawal. And the only way that I can describe that, it's like the flu times 100, and I needed $10. I didn't want to rob or steal or hurt anybody, but I couldn't go on feeling like I did. I didn't know where I was going to get 10 bucks until I looked down at my feet and I came up with my best idea. 
I walked into the bar across the street and I walked out 10 minutes later having sold the boots off my feet. You know, sometimes the greatest challenges in our lives, they help prepare us for the next thing. And for the first time in my life, I finally hit rock bottom and I became willing to do something different. In a moment of despair, I cried out for help. And I made a solemn promise on that park bench. I said, give me a second chance. If you give me a second chance, I promise I'll turn my life around and I'll do something to pay it forward. Uh, with the help of a local shelter, I got a loaner pair of shoes and I called my mom. Three days later, I found myself back in Ontario with the help and support of my mom. I entered into a detox facility and then a full residential treatment program and my life began to transform. After six months of sobriety, I decided to go back to college. And I had these really great teachers and professors who began to work with my possibility, my potential, that for so many years was hidden from me. Finally, on that fate-filled day, four years later, I walked across the stage just like this. They called out my name. They said, Joe Roberts, Dean's List. I graduated with a 3.94 GPA. And I remember walking down to where my mom was. And she gave me a big hug and said, I'm proud of you, son. And on a day that I should have been celebrating, on a day that I should have been filled with gratitude and happiness, all I could think about was how many young people just like me have the same potential and the same possibility, but they don't have my mom. They don't have one person in their life to say, I believe in you and I believe in your potential and possibility. I took that opportunity in my college education. I came back out here to Vancouver. I got my first job in sales, selling copiers for Minolta. I quickly rose and found myself in a management position. And then a friend of mine said, how would you like to start a company? And I thought, what have I got to lose? I started that company with him. And together, we worked really, really hard. And the years passed. One morning, I was driving my big car down through that old neighborhood and I stopped at a stoplight. And I looked out my window and there was a man, could have been more than 18 years old, with a shopping cart filled with cans. And it hit me because in that moment I understood the issues that create the environment for youth homelessness. Things like early childhood trauma, mental health, abuse, addiction, and family conflict in any young person's life can derail and send their trajectory of their life off in another direction. But the biggest thing it can do is hide their possibility from themselves. When I got to the office that day, sitting on my desk was a copy of Canadian Business, and I was on the cover of it as a celebrated Canadian entrepreneur. In less than 12 years, I literally went from skid row to CEO. I believe that there's more inside each and every one of us than we can see. And I kept that promise close to my heart to do something to pay it forward. At this point in my life, I began to get the opportunity to share my story in different contexts. I could speak at business venues, I could speak at conferences and schools, I could speak to politicians. And I said to my friend on an airplane ride to Calgary, I want to do something to engage the country in a different conversation about how we can support those young people who are struggling with homelessness and other challenges. And I said, how could we engage the entire country? And my friend said, well, when Canadians want to raise money for things, they run across the country. Why don't you run across Canada, Joe? I said, why don't you run across Canada? He said, okay, maybe you don't, maybe you don't run, because at the time I was 45 and 50 pounds heavier than I am today. He says, maybe you walk. And I said, well, how do we make it different and unique to homelessness? He says, I know. He says, nobody's ever pushed a shopping cart across Canada. <laughs> and I said, for obvious reasons, dude. <laughs> but there was something in that, a seed of possibility. You see, the shopping cart represents an outcome of chronic homelessness, the very thing that each and every one of us don't want to see happen to our kids or our neighbors. Along the way, we could push for change and talk about a different way of approaching and addressing youth homelessness. I got off that plane and over the next four years, 
We plotted and planned. We built a shopping cart. We got sponsors with the help and dedication of my, my lovely bride, Marie. Um, we put together all of the pieces that were needed. And finally, after four and a half years of dreaming, we found ourselves at the starting point in the most easterly part of Canada, St. John's, Newfoundland. And on May 1st, 2016, I began walking across the second widest country on the planet with one goal, to spend the next 17 months walking 24 kilometers every single day to push for change. When we began that campaign, we did so with tremendous risk and courage because we weren't sure if anybody would care. We weren't sure if anybody was going to engage and match the tremendous promise that we had made. This short video captures how Canadians responded to the push for change. <laughs> You're a great guy and you're a great Canadian and I know you're helping all the kids and uh, God love you. <laughs> 17 months walking across Canada, the equivalent, for those of you with a pedometer, the equivalent of 11,375,000 steps, five months of which was through a Canadian winter, is equal to the distance of walking from New York to Los Angeles and back to New York. And yet, for all of that, I didn't lose one pound. I didn't. Was, it wasn't until we switched to a plant-based diet where I began to shed the weight, but I'll leave that for next year's Get Inspired Talk. When it was said and done, we, we had engaged over 100,000 Canadians. We had 453 events. We raised $575,000. We had celebrity endorsements from friends like the greatest hockey dad in the world, Walter Gretzky, uh, Pinball Clemens, CFL, uh, CFL legend, and, and of course Don Cherry, um, a CBC broadcaster extraordinaire. Uh, we also had incredible support from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, police forces, and municipal forces across the country, and of course our greatest uh, partner was the Ontario Provincial Police. Uh, we even got an opportunity to engage and sit down and meet with the Prime Minister of Canada where we took the opportunity to explain to our current government what needs to get done for us to shift and push for change so that every single young person in this country grows up and reach, reaches their potential. The greatest win came not when we were pushing for change, but a month after the campaign had finished last year, when the federal government announced an 11-year plan and a $40 billion investment in homelessness across this great nation of ours. It's the largest, thank you, yeah, that's good. I will take that. It's one of the largest shows of investment that the federal government's made in, in the last uh, number of decades. And the push for change played a small but vital role in raising awareness during that 18 month period. You know, one of the things that Marie and I learned during the campaign that it wasn't necessarily what we did, it was what we inspired. 
It wasn't the, 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 the idea of walking across Canada and making that kind of commitment inspired young people to step forward and become engaged. And there's nothing quite as powerful as engaged young people doing things in their community for change. Right? As a direct result of the tens of thousands of acts of kindness and jars of nickels and sleepouts and, and, uh, and mitt gatherings and all kinds of things that they did, we launched something called the I Promise Campaign to keep the legacy of the push for change in the story going. We're now working with our charitable partners or our, or our community partners, the Ontario Provincial Police, as we, Marie and I are now working across Ontario to connect with over 300 schools, the opportunity to connect 300 schools uh, in, the, in the next uh, several months. And what we're hoping to do is to inspire these young people to make a promise, to do something in their community, to give of their time, their treasure, and their talent, to make a donation to a local shelter, to gather necessary items as we head into the colder months, or to volunteer their time at a place that can make a difference. Uh, the, the program is really simple. Write down the promise on a card like this and share it on social media. Uh, commit to making sure that that uh, promise comes to fruition, and then encouraging others to do the same. You know, one of the questions I get asked all the time when I share my story is, Joe, what do I do when I see that person who's on the street who's homeless? Do I give them food? Do I give them money? Maybe. That's always a personal choice. But the thing that I always say is that if you want to make a substantial difference, support organizations that support those individuals. Find an organization that aligns with what you believe in and give of your time and your treasure and your talent. In August, I got a phone call from the office of the Governor General of Canada. And I've been given yet another prestigious Canadian accolade. And later this year, I'll go to Ottawa and I'll meet the Governor General at Rideau Hall. And I'll ask of her the same thing I'll ask of you and anyone I come in contact with is that I want you to make a promise to give of your time, your treasure, and your talent so that no young person in this country or any country ends up pushing a shopping cart and losing sight of their possibility. You see, I firmly believe that inside each and every one of us is something extraordinary. And all we have to do is to get up off that bench and take a few proverbial steps to discover that. I also believe that the reason we don't take those action steps is that we feel our contribution won't make a difference. But I stand before you today as that difference. You see, I am a community investment gone correct. I am the result of over 10,000 people who promised to help restore my life so that I could pay it forward. If you still have doubts or disbelief, let me remind you of where this story began. On a park bench, five blocks from here, with one promise. Friends, it's time to move beyond getting inspired. It's time for each and every one of us to take action. So my question to you is what promise will you make? Hello again. I trust that you were informed and inspired by this talk. Please like, share and comment on this video and subscribe to this channel. Then join the GI Action Challenge Facebook group and take up the Speaker's Challenge.